I had a discussion with my wife the other night about an acquaintance of ours. I meet him from time to time as friend of friends, and we are connected on various social media. What fixates me about this person is how he seems to have absolutely no connection to his surroundings, apart from his girlfriend. They have no intention of having children. He has a high-paying job and seems to be doing it well. He owns no house or apartment, preferring to rent. I see him eating out on social media quite often, and not really cooking his own food. When we talk, his interests are purely in the realm of pop culture and consumerism. Our conversations, when they happen, never go any deeper than expected social platitudes. They also include a large portion of him feigning indignation that I haven't consumed the latest show, seen the latest movie, or played the latest video games. I'm sure we can all relate to the infuriatingly fake anger displayed along with a What do you mean, haven't you seen title yet? If this person were to be magically teleported to any other city in the Western world, I am convinced that his life would stay exactly the same. Most will know him as the Bugman, the perpetually adolescent male who loses himself in the mundane distractions of modernity. Was he in a higher socioeconomic class, he might even qualify for a citizen of the world, able to fit in anywhere alongside other rootless cosmopolitan characters and Davos men. It is easy to see that a life of pure consumption is no life at all. But I was left with a lingering question. Why would a man choose to reject life and merely exist? To leave the world without ever placing his mark upon it? In this video, and most likely the next, I will be exploring thoughts and possibilities related to purging the bugman within ourselves. In Men Among the Ruins, Chapter 6, Julius Evola laments the elevation of the socio-economic plane from mere materialism to an end in and of itself. To borrow patterns of thinking from Gilles Deleuze, the merchant class has subverted and stolen the sacred social orders from the warrior and priestly classes. In its place stands the economy as the highest plane of existence in modern society. Combined with an expressly or cultural Protestant work ethic, many non-Mediterranean and Anglo-Western nations find their virtues misused for the gains of what Evola names as the demonic economy. It has no qualms about what aspects of social life should be deterritorialized. It redefines what it means to work, and pawns it back to us as progress. Especially for modern men and women working in tertiary industries, I dare to think there is some sense of your work not actually mattering. Delivering a report on time, crafting that perfect presentation for the end of the week. Optimizing that piece of code just a bit better, and for what? So that Jane in HR can get her equally nebulous work done 30% faster? So that our GDP will be 2% higher this year? The people and the work they do lose any inherent meaning and value. They become good, rational actors to be sacrificed at the altar of the economy, parts of a managed whole for our managerial elites to plot into their spreadsheets. To dispel this smokescreen, we must realize that work as it exists today is most certainly of not any spiritual value. From Men Among the Ruins the fundamental criteria of the economy were that the acquisition of external goods had to be restricted, and that work and the quest for profit were justifiable only in order to acquire a level of wealth corresponding to one's status in life. This was the Thomist and later the Lutheran view. The material, modern notion of work distracts us from other paths to greatness. Before anyone listening to this decides to quit their day job, I'll point out that Evola argues from a spiritual point of view against the material world of distribution of goods and allocation of labor. Thinking about work within the paradigm or truth regime of capitalism versus Marxism, left versus right, means that you're already accepting a wrongful premise. The source of strength for the individual in this comes from rejecting the notion that work, as it is used today, inherently contains a higher purpose or a noble spirit. Again, in Men Among the Ruins, 
The term work has always designated the lowest forms of human activity, those that are more exclusively conditioned by the economic factor. It is illegitimate to label as work anything that is not reduced to these forms. Rather, the word to be used is action. Action, not work, is what is performed by the leader, the explorer, the ascetic, the pure scientist, the warrior, the artist, the diplomat, the theologian, the one who makes or breaks a law, the one who is motivated by an elementary passion or guided by a principle. What Evola here defines as action is therefore something outside of the material realm. It is a hard concept to grasp, and one I am not fully immersed in myself, but I do recognize the difference in feel. There is a marked difference in the daily tasks of work and the passions that can resonate to your very bones when performing action. Once the action is finished, you feel connected to the universe and the people your labor touches in a wholly different way. My acquaintance, the Bugman of Modernity, is never allowed a chance at performing action, or allowed for said action to lead to any meaningful transcendence. He is constantly distracted by consuming the material gains of modernity, never adding anything of value, and he is handsomely rewarded with more consumption. Again, quoting, What a sad contrast it is when the human animal is granted a maximum of comfort and equal share in a mindless and bovine happiness, an easy and comfortable life filled with gadgets, radio and TV programs, planes, Hollywood, sports arenas, and popular culture at the level of a Reader's Digest. In Ride the Tiger, a survival manual for aristocrats of the soul, Evola explores the need for a distancing from these distractions of modernity in order to achieve a clearer vision, conquering a mode of merely existing and entering a state of being. He quotes from George Gurdjieff on self-awareness. I am sucked in by my thoughts, my memories, my desires, my sensations, by the steak I eat, the cigarette I smoke, by the love I make, by the sunshine, the rain, by this tree, by that passing car, by this book. The only thing missing from these quotes to describe the Bugman archetype is to add video games and my phone to the list of distractions. To disconnect ourselves from the distractions of modernity and allow ourselves to balance atop the metaphorical tiger, we must, to borrow from Nietzsche, allow our senses to rediscover themselves in the spirit. Then enter what he and Evola calls a Dionysian state. This is an important step in subduing your ego and the true realignment of the mundane parts of ourselves into larger goals and broader perspectives. From Ride the Tiger it prevents any intoxicated self-identification with the life force, not to mention what might be induced by a thirst for life, or by the disorderly impulse to seek in mere sensation a surrogate for the meaning of existence and to lose oneself in actions and achievements. In the near future, I wish to explore one way I have personally discovered the spiritual action as opposed to work through homesteading and how the process of creating something real can give you a greater purpose in an ever-declining empire. Mental practice and knowledge of this state of mind should make you immune to the bugman's characteristics, or at least trigger a warning when you see them in yourself or those around you. If you made it this far in the video, I'd like to ask you to answer some questions I have in the comments below. What action outside of work or your day job gives you a sense of belonging? If you're a tradesman or an artisan, do you feel that you derive more meaning from the work you perform than others? Thank you for watching.